You've done some approximations of real signals with a linear combination of predictors. Um, so this is our approximation of the actual voxels that I took from the language system. Um, so the pink is the approximation, the black is the true signal, and you can see that it's not perfect. It's pretty good, but it's not perfect. Um, so for every point in time, if you take the signal and you subtract the prediction, you get the error. The difference between the actual signal and the best approximation we can come up with. Um, so here's an example. Let's look at these two uh, intervals in yellow. It's hard to see, but it's here and here. In these instances, um, the actual signal is higher than my prediction. In both of these cases, the actual signal is higher than my prediction. So a way to think about this, if the signal is bigger than the prediction, then the signal minus the prediction is bigger than zero, so my error is positive. Um, some people find it a little confusing that if the true signal is higher, the error is positive. They think the error should be negative because I'm below the signal. My prediction is below the signal. But in this case, the error is positive. And the way to think about this is if you look at the, at the top line, this line, another way to write the same thing is to write that the signal equals the prediction plus the error, which if you think about it is exactly what we said before. Explained variations, that's our approximation or our prediction, plus some noise, plus the errors, the things that are unexplained. So if you look at this thing, then it makes sense that if the signal is higher than me, then the error should be positive, right? The error should help me get even higher to get to the true signal. And here's another example. So these two intervals, now my approximation is higher than the signal. The signal is actually below my approximation. So signal is smaller than prediction, or signal minus prediction is negative, which means the error is negative. Cool? And again, because um, I am above the signal, the error which helps me to get from the prediction to the actual signal should be negative, should take me down. So the error is what is going to get me from my prediction to the true signal. OK. Um, in the analysis we just demonstrated, and think about this, don't say it out loud, what's the input? So what are the things we know? And what's the output? What are the things we're looking for? Just to make sure you understand how this thing works, what we are bringing with us and what we're trying to find. What do you think? OK, so do you get the beta weights when you start this analysis? Like, do you bring them with you from home? No, nope, you're looking for them. So the beta weights for sure are part of the output, right? So it's either A or B. What do you think? B, right? So we know the voxels, and we know the predictors. We are the scientists. We build the experiment. We generate the predictors. That's something we know. So we bring these two with us, and we ask the analysis, or we start playing with numbers in your case, to find the beta weights. So it's B. OK, um, so let's look at this again, just because it's a nice animation, and we know that these are uh, vectors. Let's add the errors now. So this is the true signal. The approximation is not exactly the true signal. To get the true signal, we need to add the errors. I always have them in the color of poop, because we don't like errors. Um, so a prediction plus the errors equals the true signal. Um, so. The bold signal, just to recap, is a ta it consists of task-related activity changes and some changes that we cannot explain, some noise. Or explained variations plus unexplained variations. The explained variations is, now in our new language, a linear combination of predictors, so the best approximation we can make, plus the errors, whatever it is we couldn't predict. So the approach that actually works for analyzing fMRI data is to find the beta weights that best approximate a voxel's actual signal. And then the best approximation is the one with the least errors. That's our criterion for the best approximation, where the errors are minimal. And then what we're going to do, once we find the beta weights, is compare the beta for sentences. And the beta for sentences tells us by how many units the signal increases when you read sentences. And we're going to compare that to the beta for non-words, which tell us by how many units the signal increases when you read non-words. Um, 
One last thing before we take a break, and then after the break you'll have an exercise about this. Mathematicians write all of this instead of in this way where uh, vectors are split, all together in one matrix. And the reason that is easier is, you know, when you have three vectors, you just have to write three things. But imagine that I gave you an exercise with 20 predictors and 20 beta weights. You would just start, have to start typing beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 20 times. That takes a long time. An equivalent way to write this is to put all the vectors in a matrix one next to the other and to put all the betas in a vector column and multiply them with the vector on the right and the matrix on the left. These two things are equivalent. So whenever you see a matrix times vector, what that means is take the top number, multiply it by the first column. Take the second number, multiply it by the second column. And uh, until you get to the last number, multiply by the last column, and then you just add the three things together. Does that make sense? We call this in general X, the design matrix that con contains all of our predictors, X1, X2, and the vector of all the beta weights, we call it generally B. Okay, and these are the next exercises, but first food. <laughs> 